You all excited about the Super Bowl? Anyone excited? Yeah? How many of you have a team in the Super Bowl that you say, this is my team, I'm so glad that I get to cheer them on, I hope that they win? Anybody in that boat? How many of you are maybe going to have the game on in the background, but you really don't care because you don't know any of the teams and you're just watching it for the ads? Okay, there's several people. How many of you are going to cheer for Seattle tonight? Anybody? All right, how many of you are for Denver? And how many of you that just clap for Denver are really just cheering for Manning? Anybody? Okay, that's what, that's what I thought. All the fantasy football folks are watching going, all right, this is my guy, and it's going to be amazing. Uh, I, I don't have a dog in this fight tonight, so I'm going to enjoy just cheering for the team. Uh, the Super Bowl for me every year is a fun time to get together with family, to get together with friends, to catch up with each other. You know, it's amazing that events bring us together. Sometimes it's awkward to do the inviting, but when you have a big day like, well, this internationally known and watched televised event of the Super Bowl, that's a great time to say, hey, why don't you come over to my house? We'll have a barbecue and watch the game. It's an awesome opportunity. Tonight, Rachel and I are going to get together with some folks that we hadn't seen in a very long time and catch up, and we're just really looking forward to the opportunity to connect with friends, and so I hope that your day will pan out like that or give you an opportunity just to be together with your family and to make some memories together. We're in the middle of a series on friendship, and this is not just calling us uh, to, to be friends, but it's giving us a deeper understanding of what friendship really means so that we can envision friendship the way that God envisions friendship. So today we're going to talk about how our neighbors become friends and don't just stay neighbors. So I hope you all can track along with me today. I have a friend who's a minister who just moved recently to a new appointment, and I caught up with him the other day and said, how are things going for you and your family? And he goes, things are great for me. Being in a church, I have instant connections to make, and I love the work that I do, but things are a little bit more difficult for my family. This friend has two kids who had been in the same school their entire lives. They knew their circle of friends. They knew the teachers there. They developed a high level of trust. And as you can imagine, it's even hard for adults to leave friends that we've grown to love and grown close to over the years. These children are struggling. They're in these new schools, but they just don't feel like they're making those friendships like they had and like they left. And so he just keeps encouraging his children, keep putting yourself out there. Keep talking to people. Just, just pray and, and wait and watch and be the kind of friend that you want to be. And I know God's going to open up those friendships for you. I said, how's it going in your new neighborhood? Because they had to move about an hour away from where they've been before. And he said, that's kind of going the same way. That where we were before, we had great relationships with those who lived next door and across the street. But we just hadn't found that kind of openness where we are. And we long for that. We long for our neighbors to also be friends. I was glad to have that conversation with him. We've all been new in a place before, and we all know what it feels like to not be a, feel like you're a part of the community around you, and you, you just long, long for those relationships to develop. I love when I drive around looking at houses and neighborhoods because they tell the story of the way life was at the time that those houses were built. I've always had a dream of living in a house with a, a really nice front porch, even one that wraps around kind of at least three quarters of the house, because I believe a home with a front porch is inviting. It says to the neighborhood, hey, we want you here. We want to be in relationship with you. And I guess I've always pictured on that porch that one of those swings that you hang from the ceiling that you can just rock on or a couple of rocking chairs there that when people come to visit you, they feel welcome like a place has been prepared before you even answer the door. Uh, we do not live in a house like that today. We're in the starter area of the neighborhood. And so we've got just enough space for a couple and a small child to stand when they ring the doorbell before coming in. And so we, we long for the time that, that we'll have that big front porch in order to sit out and, and get to know our neighbors. But you know, it's interesting. Newer houses really don't have the kind of porches that they used to. We've turned into a backyard society instead of a front porch society. And our backyards are like another room of our house. We build patios. We build outdoor kitchens. We put our playscapes up there. And, and we don't intend to do this, but in a way... We can be outside without even rubbing elbows or rubbing shoulders or even seeing our neighbors. And so we have to be intentional about connecting with neighbors so that neighbors can become friends. But neighbors are not just the people who live next to us. They're the people that are close to us that we rub elbows and shoulders with every day. Your neighbor could be a coworker that you see every day when you walk into the office. It could be somebody that you see at the plant when you go to work. It could be another kid that you sit next to in class uh, it could be the people on your soccer team or your basketball team. It can be the parents in the bleachers next to you. 
Neighbors look different, but they're folks who are just like you and me. They have hopes and dreams. They have hurts and disappointments. They struggle but look forward to a better future. And just like you and me, all of those that we brush elbows with, all that we call neighbor are in need of the grace and love of God. That same grace that we ourselves have experienced at some point. And maybe we're just the ones to offer it to them out of the relationship that we have with God. So we're three weeks into this series on friendship. The very first week we talked about what it means to be called friends of God, looking at the story of Abraham and his relationship with God. And we learned that first week that that God calls us friends when we're obedient to his leading in our lives. And so God calls us to do things, and sometimes we put up a wall and we say, no God, not now, no God, not me. How could you think I could ever do that? But God called Abraham a friend of God when he stepped out in faith and said, Lord, this is weird. I've never done anything like this before, but I'm going to trust you because you're the one calling, and I'm going to step out in faith and watch you kind of enlarge the picture in front of me. That's the kind of obedience that allows God to call us friend. And last week, we looked at the people Jesus called friends. He says that you are my friends when you love each other just like I have loved you and give your lives for others like I've offered my life to you. That's a tall order, right? So today, we're going to take that a step further and to say, when do neighbors call us friends, right? When do neighbors call us friends? We're going to be looking today in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. So if you've got a Bible there with you, I'd invite you to follow along. It'll also be up here on the screen in front of you. It's a very familiar passage for those who have grown up in the church, but I invite you to listen for what God may be saying to you that may be a little different today. So listen now for a word from God. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The expert in the law replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus responded. Do this and you will live. But the expert in the law wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Which one of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. And so here's an expert in the law. This is somebody who knew the scriptures of their day backwards and forwards. It would be like a lawyer would be today for the laws that we follow out there. Jesus knows this man. He knows his heart just like he knows us and knows our heart. He knows where he's coming from. And this man's in front of a crowd and seeks to test Jesus to discredit him somehow. And so he asks a question, teacher, what must I do to inherit the kind of life that has no beginning or end, this everlasting life that is swept up into the life of God? What must I do to inherit that? And Jesus calls him to draw from his own knowledge and experience. I love this. He says, well, what's in the law? What do you know about what the scriptures say? And this man knew the answer just like that. He said, well, of course, I'm to love the Lord my God with all of my thoughts, all of my inclination, all of my actions, and every bit of my breath. And I'm to love my neighbor as I love myself. Jesus says, exactly right. Do this and you will have the kind of life that flows from God through you and impacts the world. The quality of our relationships with others comes from two things. What we experience from our relationship with God 
and the way in which we love and care for ourselves. Let me say that again. The quality of our relationship with others spans and and stems from the kind of experience of God's love in our own life and the way that we love and care for ourselves. If you are spiritually empty, you have nothing to pour into the lives of others. And if you're not living every fiber of your being and every minute of your life for God, then you're not going to be able to represent God to be Christ for others in need because you're just not going to have the resources to share with other people. It's like this. Uh, There was a story about a a photographer that was working for National Geographic very recently who took a a very long journey to, to just go and be in the desert and take pictures of what he saw. And that that kind of spurred this thought in me about what I'm talking about today. Imagine you were on this journey, and your canteen ran out of water, and you did not know when you would get to the next town. You are so incredibly thirsty that you do not feel that you can go on without a drink of water. You look up, and in the distance, you see a well, and you say, yes, if I can just get myself to that well, I can get myself a drink. And so you drag yourself over there, and you muster up every ounce of remaining energy to pull on that rope to make the bucket come up. And as soon as you see the bucket, you see sand overflowing out of it. And you realize that you're not going to get a drink from that well. And you don't know how you're going to go on. Now, this is the picture of a life that has nothing coming into it from God and so has nothing to flow out into the lives of others. Now, unless your friend is trying to build a sand volleyball court in their backyard or is ready to pour a concrete foundation and needs to raise the lot up a little bit, sand isn't going to be very useful for your neighbor, is it? It's not going to offer something that quenches the deepest thirst that they have. But imagine this scenario. Instead of the desert, you're in a lush green landscape, and you you ran out of water, and you're looking for a drink. You see the well in the distance, you go up to it, and you begin to pull the, the rope to get the bucket up out of the bottom, and there's so much water overflowing from the bucket that it's spilling down back into the well. And you drink, and you drink, and you drink, and you feel refreshed and ready to go on your journey again. You fill up your canteen, you go on your way. Chances are, as you pass other weary weary travelers on the journey, you're going to tell them about that well, exactly how to get to it, and and what they'll find when they get there. That's the picture of a life that is overflowing, filled with the love of God, so much so that it spills out and impacts the other lives around them. That's what it means when we love the Lord our God with all of our inclinations, all of our thoughts, all of our actions, and our entire breath and life, every fiber of our being. So how are you doing at loving God? There's some measures of this, you know, because God is a, is, is a God that constantly offers himself to us. In the very act of creating the world, this is an offering of God. It's not something God had to do. It's something God did out of his creativity and out of his capacity to love others. So we get to be the recipients of that love. So when we come to worship, we're not here first to, to see what we get, but we're here to see what we can offer to God. We bring ourselves, our struggles, our disappointments, our hopes, and our dreams, and we say, here they are, God. Make them what you will. Teach me something today as I offer myself to you. That's a first step to offering ourselves to God. The second is, how are you filling yourself every day? Are you finding time to read God's word? Do you understand what you're reading? Do you have the resources there, the people in your lives to help you really begin to put this into practice in your life? And when you pray... Are you just talking to God? Are you taking time to sit there and be in the presence of God to let him guide and direct your steps? That's a hard one because it requires that we sit in silence. And when your stomach starts growling and you go, hmm, I think I want a hamburger, you got to kind of, you know, put it back down again and say, all right, God, I'm listening. I can't do this on my own. I need you to guide and direct me. When we pour ourselves into loving God, we receive his love in return. And our experience of God's love in our own lives dictates and determines the quality of love that we're able to pour out into the lives of others. The rich young ruler knew the right answer to the question up here, but he wasn't living it out with his hands and with his feet. And he was seeking to test Jesus and to say, look, I I am so great, I love my neighbors. And so he asked Jesus the question, so who is my neighbor? It's as if this man was wanting to draw circles around his relationships and keep people that he was comfortable with right in the center and keep those who were different or that he was uncomfortable with it outside of the circle. And Jesus sees right through this and he begins to tell a story. Now I find a little bit of myself here too because I see in human, humankind this 
uh, this, this tendency to be around people who are just like us, people who are of the same age, maybe the same income bracket, people that we look at and say, yeah, they're successful. They're just like, I want to be too. I want to look up to them because maybe if I spend time with them, then a little bit of it will rub off on me. And these types of comfortable friendships don't rub off on us, really. They don't require us to sacrifice any of our time, really, because the time we spend with them, we really have a great time. And they don't really require that we sacrifice any of our income other than just, you know, the, the chips and dip that we bring to the party. And so they're very, very comfortable relationships for us. This expert in the law is drawing a circle around it and saying, well, I love my neighbor. Just who is my neighbor? And I love Jesus and the way he teaches. Jesus never just answers a question. Have you ever noticed that? He doesn't say, well, everyone, duh, right? Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus tells a very long story. And I'm sure this expert in the law is sitting there going, oh, here he goes again. I just wanted to trick him in front of all these people. And now he's telling me a story. But it's an incredible, amazing story that that we can't move past without noticing what Jesus is saying here. He says, One day a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and while he was on his way, he was uh, met on the road by some robbers. They were out there by themselves, and so these robbers beat him, they stole everything he had, they stripped him down, and they left him there half dead. After a while, a priest comes along, somebody who knows this word, somebody that teaches others to live it out, and he sees the man and goes to the other side of the road and keeps going. And then later on, a Levite, one of the keepers of the temple, comes along, another religious leader, sees this man half dead. It doesn't even say he really saw it. It just says he went over to the other side of the road and kept on his journey. Do you find yourself in that? The expert in the law did because he wasn't opening himself up to the other, to those beyond his comfort zone. Then a Samaritan comes along And he sees the man. And upon seeing him, he gets up off his donkey. He immediately goes and starts ministering to this man's need. He's moved with pity and compassion for him. He takes out oil and wine and starts washing his wounds and bandaging them up. Then he places this injured man on the back of the donkey that he had been riding and walks to the next town on foot, pulling the donkey with the man on his back. He comes to a hotel and says, look, we'll check in for the night and I'll minister to your needs overnight. And he does that. And the next morning, he had some place he had to be. And so he gets up. He takes two denarii to the the innkeeper and says, look, keep him here. Take care of him. I will be back through town after my business trip is over, and I will pay you back anything that you have spent in addition to this. And he leaves. I love this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who do you think loved themselves like God loves them? Was it the priest Was it the Levite or was it the Samaritan? This sounds like a a joke, right? But it's not. The Samaritan had a healthy sense of who he is before God. That's what I get so, so much out of the story. He realized that that could very well have been him that was beaten and stripped and abandoned and left for dead. He realized that he himself is needy. He realized that if he were helpless, he would need others to come along. He realized that he was that way before God, before Jesus came into his life and made a change. And so he freely offers of himself, his time, his treasure, what he had to give at the moment to make sure that this man's needs were taken care of. Now, we know that he was busy. He had an appointment the next day that he had to leave the inn to go and take care of, right? But he had this much time. And so he knew, look, I have this. I can't offer that. But boy, I can do what I can. And so he gave the time that he had to minister to this man's needs. We don't know about his financial picture, but we know that he was so confident in his finances that he could say, I've got this money that, you know, it's it's God's anyway. It came from him. It's not because of anything that I've done to earn it. And so, yeah, I, I can give this to help take care of this man that I've never met, this stranger. So we know that he had his financial house, at least in enough order to where he could put the needs of God's people before his very own needs and know that God was going to continue to bless him. And we know that he was able to to move when he saw something that moved him with pity. He didn't just ignore it when he encountered it. So I ask all of us today, me included, how are we doing? How am I doing? How are you doing at this whole loving yourself thing? Because it's, it's not easy, especially in the world that we live in today. How do you see your time? Is time a gift from God, which he's going to continue to give you time so that you can trust him with the time you have? Or do you protect your time? because you're afraid that 
that you might not have enough time for everything you need to get done. Loving yourself is opening yourself up to trusting God with that aspect of your life. And what about your finances? Are you where you want to be? Are you in debt so much that you're afraid that, to give to the things of God because you might not have enough money to pay your bills? Maybe God's calling you to love yourself in such a way that you can be like that Samaritan to say, I I've paid off my debts. I'm at a place where I can give freely for God when God calls me to. And, and that's freeing. Do you, do you love yourself in the way that God loves you? Do you know that you're a sinner in need of redemption? A fellow traveler on the road with me in need of grace? Can you open yourself up to receive that from God? Because there's a tendency in us when we surround ourselves with other successful people who are just like we are, to not have to identify the deficiencies in our own soul, to not have to see that we too are in need, to not have to be confronted with the fact that we need to, to get some things right in our lives so that we can be redeemed by God. But like the Samaritan, when we open ourselves up to somebody who's different than us, somebody who really is at rock bottom, somebody who's crying out for redemption and help, and we help them with that, we have to acknowledge that we too are just like they are and that we could not be where we are without God and without others who have influenced us along the way. This is an important point here that we cannot miss. And it's critical to neighbors becoming friends. The quality of our relationships is determined by how we love and care for ourselves because that will spill out into those around us. Uh, incredible stories this week coming out of Birmingham and Atlanta. Uh, we, we tended to miss snowpocalypse here. Everybody's safe from the storm. I mean, earlier this week, it was, the sky is falling, cancel school, close all the offices, stay in, don't get out, go to the stores and empty the shelves. Snowpocalypse, right? <laughs> But we, we survived that, and, and it wasn't really a big deal here, and had a great day with family, hopefully, uh, that day. But our neighbors uh, to the east were not so lucky. Uh, Birmingham got slammed, and folks who didn't know that the snow was going to fall at the density that it did as quickly as it did got stranded on the roads on the way home. They just could not move their vehicles any further. And what was so amazing in these moments, I read these stories about how uh, complete strangers welcomed some of these stranded motorists into their own homes because they had nowhere else to go. People with resources like bus companies sent charter buses out along the highways so that some of these stranded motorists could come and be warm on the bus and get a good night's sleep. Grocery stores opened up their doors and the aisles were just lined with people who needed to rest. And Chick-fil-A came out in Birmingham and offered free food to people. We have some friends in Atlanta who were also taken by surprise by just how quickly the snow stacked up and they got trapped at work. Uh, one of our friends is a pastor. Her son is in daycare there at the church and so they waited until the snowfall stopped. They couldn't get their car out of the parking lot so they had to walk five miles home in the snow. I mean, it sounds like the way that our grandparents told the stories. I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. But this was their real story. And her husband who worked 45 minutes away from their house was on his commute and he got to a place where his car just would not get up a hill, and he was done. And so he had to abandon his car, uh, and he was about two miles from another church he knew and another Methodist pastor that had a parsonage, and he walked two miles in pitch black, total darkness, and knocked on the door in the middle of the night and said, hey, can I stay with you? I have nowhere else to go. It was like 32 hours from the time he left work before he walked through his front door, and his car was still abandoned on the side of the road. But there were people who lived nearby these highways that made sandwiches and food and stood out there in the cold to offer what they had to those who did not have in that moment. Those who a moment before had been successful, but then in that moment had nothing that they could do to help their own situation. And like I said, strangers opened up their houses and said, yeah, come into my guest room. You and your family can stay here. People they had never even met. You know, I don't want it to take a snowpocalypse to move me into that kind of compassion and pity for those who live around me. Our neighbors are not just those who live next door, although those people are included. They're folks that we brush elbows with each and every day. People who have the same hurts, the people who have the same hopes and dreams, the same uh, vision for the future and need the love of God that we ourselves have received. And so I want to invite you this week to be bold. Now, not all of us are extroverted, but this is a soul thing. It's not a personality thing. God calls us as we love him with everything we have and love him and live with our breath and our actions and our thoughts, directing all of them toward God. We're to direct our whole love and life toward our neighbors too. Remember what Jesus said, offering ourselves for them as he offers himself for us. So here's the challenge. You ready? This next week, maybe there's a coworker that you pass by every day and you say hi to and this person is grumpy to you and short with you every day. 
Don't stop saying hi to them. Maybe they, they have something going on in their lives that we don't even know about or understand, something that just is weighing them down more than they can bear. And maybe your faith and example is what they need to draw them out of that and to, to be healed, to begin to see that in their brokenness and your brokenness coming together, they can find Christ. Maybe bring an extra sandwich one day this week and just say, hey, I'd love to have lunch with you. I've got an extra subway here or whatever. Offer yourself to them. Maybe at school, if, if you're in elementary school or high school, maybe go and sit with somebody who's sitting alone at lunch, even if your other friends aren't going to go. Uh, put your reputation on the line and, and just be present with somebody and make a new friend. I think that's a way that we can begin to live this out. Well, you know those homeless folks that stand on the corner that we ignore? You know, we roll up our window and we kind of, you know, kind of put on our music and bob our heads with our eyes closed until the, the light changes? Well, maybe this week prepare for your encounter with that homeless person that you don't really look at, but you know is there every day. But we, we've even got homeless bags here. You can take one, and, and when you pass them one day this week, just say, hey, here's something that can help your daily needs be met today, and bless them. Uh, but, but if we're to see our neighbors becoming friends, if we're to, to befriend those who we brush elbows with the same way that God has befriended us, it's going to require that we offer our lives to them, that we take risks, that we begin, you know what? I can offer you hope because I've received hope. I can offer you love because I've received love. And I can offer you grace because it's only on God's grace that I stand. Be bold this week. Be love and be hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that without you we can do nothing. And we are so grateful that you call us friends when we trust you with our whole lives and we begin to step out in faith to follow you. Lord, we want to be friends of your Son who love others like you have loved us. Let that love that you've poured into us overflow out of us like a watershed until the whole world is just covered with your love. But Lord, we realize that we're broken. Not one of us here is perfect. We're just trying to live our lives. We're doing the best we can. And we know that, that we can do even better when we direct our eyes to you. When we receive our lives from you and we live our lives for you. And so, God, help us to not be blind to the needs of those that we brush up against every day. Out of our hurt, help us to identify with theirs. But out of the love we've received, help us to love them. Lord, we remember what you've done in our lives. We remember the hope that you gave us in a hopeless time. We remember the way in which you loved us back into right relationship with you. And we remember what your son Jesus Christ did on that night that he was to give himself up for us at a dinner with his closest friends. He veered from the ritual and he took bread. And he offered a prayer of thanksgiving to you and, and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Every time you come to this table and eat this bread, remember me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to you once again and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you for this is my blood of something brand new and different, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink from this cup, remember that you are loved, that you are forgiven, and go and offer that mercy and grace to others. So Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts that we offer you today and upon our lives, that we may be the body and blood of Christ that, that goes out and offers your grace and redemption to the world. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry until all the world is overflowing with your love and we come together with our neighbors at your heavenly banquet. We pray all this in and through uh, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.